For Turning Point, the session ID. Is anyone able to connect? Thank goodness. That, that's a good sign. If you can connect, that it may work, or at least we're halfway there. <clears throat> okay, so y'all feel uh, good about the abdomen? Everyone feels very comfortable in uh, where, they're, where they're at now, the abdomen. I, I do. I, I thought the last lab that we had was just really nice coming together moment where we got to review everything and have a little bit of time to uh, get our heads together before we continue into the uh, challenging block of the pelvis and the perineum. And it's not going to be too challenging, hopefully, because I'm going to help lay it out for you in a way that will sort of push you along your course since you have more things to learn than you have time to learn it. And so today we get to start the pelvis and the perineum. <clears throat> it's kind of an introductory le le uh, lecture, learning module, that's going to um, lead you into more detail in the next two lectures uh, that I give you on uh, the perineum and then the internal pelvic organs and the specific details that are relevant to each organ. Okay, so today's sort of more introduction. <clears throat> All right, so here are your learning objectives. Uh, which for me are your learning expectations, and so I have uh, the links into the location in the PowerPoint that these lecture objectives are discussed. Okay, so where is the pelvic cavity? We've been in the abdomen, you can, you can peek down into, looks like the bottom, and it looks like there's nothing left. How in the world do we have more things? And you're telling me challenging structures and uh, to learn here. It seems like we're at the end. Well, it's, it's true, uh, it does look like you're at the end, and you are staring at the pelvis when you're looking inferiorly from the abdomen, but the pelvis is tilted posteriorly, so although it is inferior, oh, uh, he said he fixed that, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> that's surprising. Shoot, okay. I don't see the thing. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> do you know how to do this? Thank you. saying that there's a program down here, but I don't see the icon. Logitech app, maybe look in here. Logitech app. Uh, okay. Maybe. We want laser. Right? Yeah, laser. We don't want highlight anymore. Maybe that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. All right, cross your fingers. Ah, oh, it helps if I press the right button. Okay, it was worth the wait. <clears throat> Thank you, Morgan. All right, so the pelvis is inferior to the abdomen, so this is where you're looking at, and when you look down, 
you're looking at most likely at this point still peritoneum that's reflected over the pelvic organs. So a lot of the pelvic cavity is still hidden to you. Okay. Uh, some of you, you know, have taken maybe taken that off, or you can see the organs that are in the pelvis. Uh, depending on the fullness of the bladder, the fullness of the rectum, and whether or not there is a uterus. But you can also see that the pelvis is tilted, not, it's not depicted quite as uh, well in this cartoon drawing, but it's tilted posteriorly from the abdomen. And so uh, other point that I wanted to make, everything that passes from this trunk into the lower extremity has to pass through this pelvic cavity somehow to make it to an exit into the lower extremity. And some of the uh, structures are going to pass underneath that inguinal ligament that you've already studied. You might, oh my gosh, there's more down there? There is. There's more down there that you didn't learn when you just looked at the superficial aspect of that area. But deep to this inguinal ligament, there are neurovascular structures that are actually passing into the lower extremity out of the pelvis. Okay, so we have more to go over that um, are going to be continuations of areas that are already familiar to you, luckily. All right, so this pelvic cavity that you're staring down into um, is really well protected by a uh, bony frame that's called the pelvic girdle. Okay. So the pelvic girdle is made up of, of uh, multiple bones, and it is going to attach to the lower extremity. So the pelvic girdle is, is going to be the bony attachment that will transmit the weight of your body to your lower extremities. And uh, so when Dr. Muscle talks to you about the lower extremity, he's going to talk about how that weight is transferred through ligaments, in particular, uh, and musculature, but mainly a lot of important ligaments. And the text goes through these ligaments in more detail than you ever wanted to learn, because I spent last week reading it, um, in the pelvis chapter. But he's actually going to talk about those weight-bearing ligaments and the transfer of weight in the lower extremity part of this block. Okay, So it's not like I'm avoiding it on purpose, actually. I am avoiding it on purpose, because I was like, oh my gosh, that's a lot to explain. But luckily, he's going to do that in the lower extremity. Okay? <laughs> so I only have to talk about a few ligaments here. All right, so the function of this girdle is not only just to protect the organs inside, but it provides attachment points for musculature that um, it are, the muscles are doing special jobs, like they are supporting the viscera that's housed in the pelvis, so they're giving the viscera some support so they don't just fall out of the bottom of the pelvis. But it, uh, the pelvic girdle is also providing muscle attachments uh, for muscles that are part of the perineum and the external genitalia region, and also for your erectile tissues. Okay, And so the pelvic girdle has multiple functions, and it will serve you well to go through the anatomy of the pelvic girdle and learn the points really from the beginning, so that as we talk about structures uh, attaching to, coursing around, or going under and over, you'll uh, be more comfortable with the language that's being thrown at you when you know where those points are. Otherwise, it's just random words being thrown at you, um, and it's going to be harder to put this together. Okay. And that's why um, at the beginning we're going to talk about the bones. And I actually have a movie here that I made uh, yesterday at Pause Football um, and made the movies uh, from YouTube that I have embedded in the lectures. That you can hold a bone and then I, please don't make fun of me because I don't, and I don't want to watch them again, so don't play them in front of me. But um, I go through the bony landmarks on each of the bones and point them out to you. So if you're holding your singular coxal bone from your bone box and you're having trouble because every flat picture is difficult to, it's difficult to transfer from a textbook to that um, very irregularly shaped three-dimensional coxal bone. Okay. All right. And so the pelvic girdle is uh, made up of three bones that uh, it, it originally were three bones that are going to fuse uh, throughout adolescence. And um, it also involves the sacrum and uh, the coccyx, although the coccyx plays a lesser role in actual structural support of the pelvic girdle, the sacrum is sort of the main player. So you have the coxal bone, which is this irregularly shaped bone. Here's one, there's one on each side. And then you have the sacrum and the coccyx that play roles in this girdle. Okay. All right. Um, and so this is a lateral view of the coxal bone. 
Uh, I wanted to mention that in your textbook and your atlas, they use coxal bone, oscoxae, hip bone, and pelvic bone all the time, like interchangeably. They just throw different words in different sentences. I noticed that. And they're all referring to this coxal bone or pelvic bone or hip bone, and they're all um, okay to use uh, because your resources use them. But they're all anatomically talking about this fused uh, bone that originally started from three different bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Okay, and the articulations that occur in these bones, between these bones, uh, after fusion of the coxal bones, are the sacroiliac articulation, which I have here uh, highlighted in yellow. Between the sacrum and the coccyx, you have a sacrococcygeal joint, and then you have the pubic symphysis, which you should already be starting to be familiar with from um, talking about the inguinal ligament and the pubis part of the coxal bone that is here highlighted in green and you can turn it off so that you can twist yourself on various structures later. I'm trying to transfer my lectures presentation into more study guides so I have a lot of stuff in so you can flip through and use them as as study guides as we become more active learners and this institution switches over to active learning. Okay so the ilium is kind of the more superior part of the coxal bone and it has a ala, which is also referred to as the wing of the ilium that, that sticks up that flared portion. And then it has a thicker, uh, inferior body, which is part of the acetabulum. And so uh, that is uh, depicted all up here. And there are some special bone landmarks. Um, I show you in the video, there's an anterior superior iliac spine that is going to be important for muscle attachment, as well as the anterior inferior iliac spine. And then posteriorly, there's a posterior superior iliac spine and a posterior inferior iliac spine. That's more important for uh, musculature, but also ligamentous attachment. So you should use those as big orientation points when you're holding the coxal bone for anterior and posterior, because the rami on the inferior part are somewhat ambiguous, although the acetabulum helps you orient yourself to the lateral uh, aspect of the coxal bone. Okay, and so all three of the bones are going to play a part in the acetabulum, which is where the head of the femur articulates with the coxal bone itself. The ischium is the uh, posterior inferior aspect of the coxal bone. So this is a lateral view. This is posterior over here. Uh, it has a large body, which is this part here. I mean, large, it's not as large as the ilium, but it has a robust body. And then a uh, smaller ramus that is going to uh, stick out anteriorly, and it is going to be continuous with the inferior ramus of the pubis, okay? And so the ramus of the ischium, it just sort of blends in with the ramus of the pubis, uh, making up a hole in the coxal bone called the obturator foramen. Also on the ischium, there is a large uh, tuberosity called the ischial tuberosity, and then there is a smaller uh, projection uh, superior to that, which is called the ischial spine. And the ischial spine is going to separate notches in the coxal bone um, that are called the greater and lesser sciatic notches, which we will I have highlighted on, a, on the next slide. Uh, next slides to come. And so when you're um, trying to quiz yourself, you can turn on the highlights and it highlights the areas that match with the colors of the names. Okay. All right. And so <clears throat> the uh, coxal bone ends up having uh, some depressions or notches that are called the greater sciatic notch and the lesser sciatic notch. The greater is immediately inferior to the anterior, the ante uh, so posterior inferior iliac spine. Immediately inferior to that is a large notch, and it's just called greater because it's bigger, called the greater sciatic notch. And then you have the ischial spine, the spine of the ischium, and underneath that, there is a smaller notch called the lesser sciatic notch, okay? And uh, so you want to find those on your bones because we have structures that are going to course in these notches. We also have muscles that cover them up. And so it's going to help you, though, um, with orientation, although you're not going to be able to see the notches uh, on, in the cadaver because of the connective tissue and the muscles that are on top. It really helps you uh, mentally orient yourself to what should be in this area. 
Oh, I also have a movie, uh, a YouTube movie that I made where I, um, I took the, the notches and I attached ligaments to them and I showed you um, where the notches were and so you can watch that. All right. And then the last part of the coxal bone is the pubis. And the pubis, uh, you've already seen somewhat when you talked about the inguinal ligament attaching from the ASIS all the way to the um, pubic crest and tubercle here. And so you, you're kind of more familiar with the superior part up in this area. But it also um, has an inferior projection, the inferior ramus of the pubis. So the pubis has two rami, an, a superior and an inferior, the inferior one being continuous with the ischial ramus. Together, they're called uh, the, uh, the ischial pubic ramus. So when people are referring to and clinicians refer to, you read literature um, or do research on structures around that structure, they don't say the inferior pu uh, ramus of the pubis. They usually refer to it as the uh, ischial pubic ramus together, and that's what they're talking about. And your textbook does as well. Okay, and then also, um, you know, the, the, the pubic bone has a crest superiorly, superior posteriorly, and a tubercle that sits laterally on the crest, both of which are going to be important. And it extends posteriorly as the pectineal line of the pubis or the, pub, uh, the um, pectin pubics. So it kind of has a couple different terms, but it's really just a ridge that extends back from the pubic bone and is continuous with a ridge that is coming down from the ilium called the arcuate line. And so this pectin pubis is continuous with the arcu arcuate line, and together those structures are called the linea terminalis. So just in case you hear, you're going to read these in the dissector and be like, I thought this was the arcuate line, and now they're saying linea terminalis. They're meaning the whole ridge from the ilium all the way to the pectin pubis on the pubis, okay? All right, and so those ridges, yes? Is this the same arcuate line where the pressure uh, changes? No, it's, a, it's not the same arcuate line on the rectus sheath. It's a, it's a bone landmark that's on the ilium, yes. I know, I'm sorry, they use the same term, but it's not the same thing. I know, it's not the same thing, sorry. Okay, so um, these bony ridges make up what's called the bony, the pelvic brim. So you have um, the uh, pelvic crest here, you have the pectin pubis, you ha or pectineal line, the arcuate line, and then also part of the ala or wing of the sacrum and the sacral promontory all together are going to make a pelvic brim, which is the pelvic inlet. So where things are uh, and you can think, it might be the easiest way to think about it is, is a uh, fetus is going to descend into the pelvic inlet to come deeper into the pelvis or, or through childbirth, although it's already going to be there uh, nine months of pregnancy. Okay. And then another anatomic point that's important to you uh, is called the pelvic arch. And if you look at the pubic symphysis and you look at the inferior pubic rami, where they come together, there is an angle that is formed, this subpubic angle. And that is formed by this pubic arch. Uh, and it, it's important uh, for, for various measurements that you can do to try to estimate the size of the pelvis without having to do any kind of medical imaging. But it's also used um, in an anthropological approach to examine bones and to try to determine the age and sex of uh, bones that are found uh, after postmortem. Okay, so the pelvic inlet or that pelvic brim is going to be the transition points between two different parts of the pelvis, one of which is called the greater pelvis, which is superior to the pelvic inlet. And you can see that depicted here in yellow. The greater pelvis is not the part of the pelvis that holds the pelvic viscera. So up here, um, we have the uh, iliac crest, and you're looking at the iliacus muscle. You don't see any viscera up there, right? You see, you see a nerve maybe cutting across the iliacus, right? But you don't, you don't see the organs aren't up there. That's the greater pelvis. So although it doesn't have greater importance, it's, it's very large and, and impressive the way that it's flaring out. And it's big for structural support and for locomotion, okay? And the lesser pelvic is going to be between the pelvic brim or pelvic inlet 
and the inferior part of the bony pelvis where the pelvic outlet is, the space in between these two planes is called the lesser pelvis. And that is the part of the pelvis where the viscera are going to be contained and also the superior part of the perineum. So it's of great importance, um, and that's the area that you're going to spend most of your time uh, looking at in atomic points. Okay. And so lastly, uh, the pelvic outlet, uh, which is depicted in this dotted line. But this is an inferior view of the pelvic outlet uh, during childbirth. And you can see that we do have bone, bones that are going to make up the borders of this pelvic outlet. And it's good to get a grasp uh, mentally of in this inferior view so you can see the pubic symphysis. So if this is the inferior pubic ramus here, or the uh, ischial pubic ramus, because here's the ischium, here's the ischial tuberosity, and then we have some ligaments that are going to span this space, and here is the coccyx and the inferior sacrum part. Okay, and so that this is the pelvic outlet, right, where uh, everything's going to pass through that doesn't come out laterally. And I just want to make a point that in anatomic position, the pelvis is tilted. The pelvis is tilted. So when you're holding the bones, you can see that the ASIS, which is up here, this point, is in the same plane as the pubic symphysis. So where you have the inclination to hold the pelvis like a bowl, this way, the bowl is tilted forwards. Okay, And that gives the pelvis that posterior inferior tilt away from the abdomen. Okay, so which of the following distances should you measure, if you were a clinician, you needed to know, uh, in a pregnant woman? It says the poll is open. Anybody, can you respond? Yes? Good. Okay, make your determination, please. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so most people put the right answer, which is a sacral promontory and the pubic symphysis. So you would want to know the distance between those two structures to see whether or not it's adequate for passage of the fetus through the birth canal. But the problem with this Let's see if it adjusts here. The problem is that, and that's called the true conjugate. So that is the measurement between the sacral promontory and the posterior aspect of the pubic symphysis. But the bladder's in the way. So you can't just measure that. And so what ends up happening uh, in a clinical sense is that you can measure a diagonal conjugate, which you, when you place your uh, fingers in the vagina, you can feel the sacral promontory with the tip of your middle finger and then you're going to measure not the posterior part of the pubic symphysis, but the anterior part, and then you subtract a couple centimeters, and you want it to be over 11 centimeters, or at least that's what your textbook says. And your textbook has um, a blue clinical box on this where it talks about a few other uh, measurements that you can look at in the pelvis. But this is one of the measurements uh, for make sure that the pelvic size is adequate for passage of the fetus during childbirth. Okay. All right, and so that brings us to the difference between the male and the female uh, bony pelvis. So the uh, male bony pelvis has a subpubic angle, which is much more narrow than the female subpubic angle, which is wider. And also the volume of the pelvis in the female is wider and than it is in the male. And what I did is I made a little movie here, a YouTube movie, where I had a male and a female uh, pelvis, pelvis, and I showed you, you can see them. I have them next to each other and tilt them and so that you can see the difference in the, in the size and the shape. But the reality is, is that there's a lot of variation in this. There's no such thing as a male pelvis in a female pelvis. There's a lot more than just two. And there are um, different characteristics 
that are going to give you an indication whether the pelvis uh, may, is, may have come from a male or a female, but it's not always going to be the case anatomically. And the textbook has a blue box on this. They go into about four times more detail, but it's very interesting, uh, so you should take a look at that. But this is sort of on the most basic level. Um, the pelvis is one of the place, the pelvic bones are one of the uh, places in the body where you can really tell a difference between sexes in most cases. And so it was a really interesting read there. And then don't forget to check out the movie. Okay. So what is in the pelvic cavity? Well, it is going to differ on whether or not um, the pelvis is a uh, uterine holding pelvis or non-uterine. Not necessarily male or female, because lots of females can have their uterus uh, removed. Uh, and so Generally speaking, though, let's, let's say uh, it is a typical pelvis for male and female. The male's uh, pelvis is going to have uh, the bladder and the rectum and then some other organs like the prostate, seminal vesicles. And the female pelvis is going to have a bladder, uterus, and a rectum uh, with ovaries as well and fallopian tubes. And we're going to talk about all of those structures in greater detail on Friday, like uh, innervation, well, uh, innervation, blood supply, and all of the parts of those organs. So we're just sort of getting our feet wet today, but we're going to pick up all of the contents of the pelvic cavity and learn more about their details on Friday, okay? Oh, and you don't want to forget that what you saw in this section, you were having to hold up the intestines, right? You were having to hold up the sigmoid colon as it drooped down here and parts of the small intestine. You had to hold those up because here's the peritoneum uh, reflecting over the organs. And so so in, in life, when everything's in its place, you still have loops of intestines down here. And so although that those aren't just pelvic organs, they're still involved. So when you're looking at medical imaging, you shouldn't forget about those points, okay? All right, this is just for fun for you um, because the walls of the pelvis is kind of like a boring part where later on um, when you're trying to uh, review, you can just click on it and it can remind, you can guess what, what it is first to help for its retrieval and then you can click to see if you're right and you can go back to the quiz. But I don't need it for the presentation because we're going to go over them, but that's just for you later, okay? All right, so to thinking about the walls of the pelvis and the way that the pelvis is tilted that means that all, most of the weight-bearing part of the pelvis is going to be this, an this anterior, this anterior, <laughs> I know what happened. No, I don't. This anterior inferior part of the pelvis where you have the superior and inferior pelvic rami and the pelvic symphysis, all the weight is coming down this way onto this anterior inferior pelvic wall. Okay, And so it is important that that's made of bones and not just mus muscles. Uh, because you have to think about the bladder, and then when, when the, you have a large uterus with the uh, fetus inside, that's pressing all down on those bones. Okay, the lateral pelvic wall, just moving laterally, you're going to have a, a musculature um, or a muscle that is going to fill the lateral wall called the obturator internus. And so this is the obturator and turvus. So this is the anterior inferior, and this is just the lateral wall. Not This is sort of uh, posterior lateral. The obturator internus muscle is going to fill up the inside of the obturator foramen. So the obturator foramen, <laughs> depicted here, is, has a membrane that is covering this foramen, the opening. But it also has a muscle that lies on top called the obturator internus. There's also an externus that is not the same as the internus and not going in the same plane, although they end up in a relatively similar place. But just bear with me. So this is a big player in the pelvis because this muscle, uh, it fills up the hole, but it also has an important fascia, fascia that is on top of the muscle or deep to or on the inside or medial called the obturator internus fascia. And this fascia has a thickening, has a thickening that is called the tendinous arch. And the tendinous arch here, 
is going to be a major site of muscle attachment for the pelvic diaphragm, which is filling up the floor. Okay, so the obturator internus muscle that makes up the lateral wall is very important, and you should spend some time looking at it in all places. Atlas, dissector, pull out the bone and imagine it. And in that movie that I posted from YouTube, I, I make a pretend obturator internus with tape on the inside of the obturator foramen. Okay, the posterior medial aspect of the pelvic cavity is made up by the sacrum and the coccyx. So don't forget that. We have those bones down there, and they're part of the vertebral canal, or vertebral column, and they are depicted here in this uh, schematic, and you're going to uh, hold that in your head as a visualization when you're palpating inside the cadaver, the back of the pelvis, that you're, that's what you're feeling, the sacrum and the coccyx. And then the posterior lateral, so between where the obturator internus is and the sacrum of the coccyx, we've got some muscular ligamentous stuff going on, okay? And uh, the muscular part of the muscular ligamentous is made up mainly of the piriformis muscle. So there is another very special, important muscle, which is also included in the movie, uh, which is called the piriformis muscle. That's going to fill up that greater sciatic foramen. So when you're looking inside the pelvis, you're like, where's that greater sciatic foramen? It's behind, or the piriformis muscle is in the greater sciatic foramen. And it's going to, of course, laterally attach to the femur. Okay, so a main player. And then the ligamentous part of the posterior lateral wall is made up of some special ligaments. And these are the ligaments I am going to talk about and you do want to know. So the posterior sacroiliac ligament is going to extend downward and turn into a sacrotuberous ligament that is going to attach from the sacrum. It has a wide attachment on the sacrum, and then it comes down and attaches to the ischial tuberosity, that large projection or tuber tubercle on that ischium that we talked about. Okay. So you're not going to be able to see it right away because the gluteus maximus muscle is in the way, but you will palpate it and we're going to uh, maneuver the gluteus maximus in a way in which you can visualize this ligament. Okay? Knowing the bony landmark that it attaches to will help you get your orientation in lab. In addition, you have a ligament that also attaches from the sacrum, but it has a much smaller attachment and it's medial or deep to the sacrotuberous ligament. And this ligament is called the sacrospinous ligament because it goes to the ischial spine. And so when you're looking, here's the ischial spine that we talked about, and there you can see the sacrospinous ligament attaching. So the sacrotuberous ligament comes down, and it's going to um, be just superficial to the sacrospinous ligament. And these ligaments close off these notches to make foramen. And so you end up with a greater sciatic foramen now because you have a closing off of the uh, sacrospinous ligaments and you have a lesser sciatic foramen because you have the sacrotuberous ligament closing that foramen off. Okay. Good? Good. All right. Now don't forget, or don't forget, I'm telling you for the first time, but probably not, that the sacrum has these sacral foramina, anterior sacral foramina, that are going to be passageways for nerves, the ventral rami of the sacral spinal nerves, to come into the pelvis, some of which, which are going to continue down into the lower extremity, giving some innervation along the way. Okay? I'm not going to be talking to you about the sacral plexus because Dr. Campo is actually going to do all the nerves. But they're there, and I'm going to maybe sometimes point out, don't forget, because when you're in lab, you can't separate them that way, because they're there. And the lab uh, guide, the dissection, dissector, will tell you relationship of arteries and muscles and relationship to these sacral nerves. So they are important, and you can, um, you're going to follow them, although we're not going to talk about them formally until next week. All right. So which, is consider, which of the following bone regions are considered a weak zone of the pelvis? Is considered a weak zone of the pelvis.
Now, the last one worked. Ah, poll is open. Okay, so which of the following bone regions is considered a weak part? What do you think? And your responses are rolling in. All right, please make your choice. Five, four, three, two, one. I press the button. I press it one more time. Pull's still open. All right, let's try this button. All right, let's try this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? That is so weird because it's showing up on the computer. You can see it on your phones. Okay. If I swap presenter and slideshow, you can see that it's showing up on one of the screens and not the other. All right, so most of you put, uh, well, actually, there's a good, there's a good um, choice range here. Is that going to work? Oh, yeah, all right. That's because they're all weak zones. All of these points are classified or, or areas of being weak on the coxal bone or articulation with the sacrum. And so this is, again, from one of the clinical boxes in the chapter talking about fractures and injuries to the coxal bone. So remember when Dr. Landry talked to you about the pelvis, and he mentioned that the pelvis isn't going to just break in one spot. It's going to fracture in multiple spots. And these were the places that you should look when you're looking at a radiograph because uh, you should look for fractures because they're weak points in the pelvis. And so it just is an interesting uh, clinical aspect that I, I read uh, in the text. Okay. All right, so the pel now we have the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor is going to be musculature mainly, made up of muscle. Right? And these are, are important muscles. You'll be able to find most of them or some of them in lab uh, when you're doing the dissection. The pelvic floor is more of a bowl shape or it's been described as a hammock because it attaches um, laterally to the obturator internus fascia, that tendinous arc, but then it descends in the middle like a hammock would. And, uh, and so you should wrap, I think we even have some models in the lab. Do we have the models of the, yeah, of the pelvic diaphragm? So make sure that you look at models, look at um, atlases, uh, and then also try to find it in your cadaver during dissection. And so that's how it's positioned more like a hammock here from the obturator internus fascia, the tendinous arc, and then it comes and joins the other side in the midline. The anal coccygeal ligament, which it runs from the anus to the coccyx, or rectal anal junction rather, is going to be in this area, and some of the pelvic diaphragm is going to attach to this ligament and doesn't have a posterior bony attachment. But it has different parts, this pelvic diaphragm. The first part and the most posterior part is called the coccygeous muscle. So this muscle is considered a muscle all on its own and is not part of the rest of the pelvic diaphragm, which is sort of talked about in unison. The coccygeous muscle is going to be found inferior to where the piriformis is. So the piriformis fills that greater sciatic foramen. Here's the ischial spine, and the coccygeous muscle attaches to the ischial spine, or really the uh, sacrospinous ligament, and then it's going to course to the coccyx uh, and the anococcygeal ligament medially. So uh, you're going to be able to find this in lab. It's pretty decent, usually, unless you have a, a very wim wimpy muscles. Then the rest of the pelvic diaphragm is talked about in unison a lot. It's called the levator ani. It's called the levator ani. And it has three parts, but it can, it's talked about collectively. The pelvic diaphragm is the levator ani and the coccygeous muscle together. But the levator ani has three parts. Here you can see the pelvic diaphragm in a, uh, a lateral view or mid-sagittal view, uh, rather. And it's just being suspended, and it's going to separate the perineal region from the pelvic cavity. You can see that both in the female or the uterus-containing pelvis and the, the non-uterine pelvis. All right, 
the most medial aspect of the levator ani is called the puborectalis. So this portion is going to wrap around the recto-anal junction and create a sling that is going to help with um, continence. Okay? And so uh, the puborectalis is the most medial part. It's going to course from the pubic bone and it's going to wrap around the recto-anal junction and attach to the anal coccygeal ligament, and it's going to also attach with the other puborectalis muscle from the other side. And here you can see in a different view the puborectalis uh, coming around and creating a sling that angles the recto-anal junction. We're going to talk about the rectum and the anal canal when we do uh, the other lectures that I do for you. This is just an introduction. And you can see how it's going to make this sling that is going to give this angle that helps hold fecal material inside the rectum and allows you to choose when it is that you're going to defecate. And then in this picture, because um, it's a female uterus, you can see the vagina here, and this is the portion of the urethra. So the pelvic diaphragm has hiatus. Um, this is going to allow for the passage of the rectum and into the anal canal, and also the anterior portion is the urogenital hiatus, where you're going to have the urethra pass through, and in females, the vagina. The lateral to the puborectalis is another portion of the levator ani called the pubococcygeus. The pubococcygeus does also attach to the pubic bone anteriorly, but it's going to um, come and course posteriorly and attach mainly to the anococcygeal ligament that is um, just anterior to the coccyx. And it, the, this anococcygeal ligament really uh, cements and gives structure and, and um, support to the anal rectal junction. Okay. So the uh, last part of the levator ani is called the iliococcygeus, and it is going to originate from uh, mainly the obturator fascia, the tendinous arc of the obturator internus, and is going to course immediately and attach not only to viscera in the pelvic cavity, but the anococcygeal ligament. So the levator ani has three parts, but they blend with each other. You're not going to find the muscle have an abrupt ending and then the next muscle start. It's just this continuous uh, sheet of muscle that's called the pelvic diaphragm. Okay? And so you're going to look at where they attach to and where they course, and that will help you give names to the various regions. The importance of the levator ani and, and really um, also the pelvic diaphragm as a whole is to uh, tonically contract. It's always contracted to help you um, combat the forces of gravity and the forces of the abdominal organs and pelvic organs pushing downward. Because you don't need, that's the only thing that's holding that pelvic outlet um, as a closed space and not allowing um, your contents to fall through the floor of your pelvic cavity. I mean, besides the, the, the fact that the organs are attached, most of them are attached by ligaments and mesenteries to the posterior abdominal wall, but you can have prolapse through the floor. And so it's, it's a very dynamic muscle, and it actually actively contracts when you cough or sneeze or vomit to really give additional support to the viscera so that you don't have prolapse of the organs to the pelvic floor. Okay. So which of the following muscles of the pelvis would you expect to be torn most often during childbirth in a situation where there was a muscle torn during childbirth? Come on, pole. All right, let me click it. You've been so good today. Please work. Ah, pull is open. <laughs> Fantastic. So make your choice. It's 
we have limited choices here, but we've talked about all of these muscles. Okay, make your choice. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to try this button this time. Ah, all right. Most people put pubic rectalis. And the reality is that is true. In addition, the next muscle, pubococcygeus, those, those muscles are right next to each other in the most medial muscles. And because they're thin and uh, they're just adjacent to the birth canal, those two muscles, pelvic muscles, can be injured or are injured most commonly during childbirth if you do have a situation where they're injured. Okay, so good. It's just I'm thinking anatomically. This is also included in a clinical box in the textbook uh, where they talk about other types of injuries to the pelvic floor as well. I would um, recommend that you read that through. It's really interesting. Okay. Now, the peritoneum and the peritoneal cavity. We've talked about this. You all learned it. You've seen it. The peritoneum does project inferiorly into the pelvis. But instead of sort of lining the walls and uh, being the main fascia that's included, it really just reflects. It doesn't keep going. The pelvic organs aren't in, embraced in peritoneum. It reflects on top of the pelvic viscera. So the pelvic viscera ends up being outside of the peritoneum, inferior to, not within the peritoneal cavity, with a small exception, okay? And so this is what you have been looking at, is looking downward onto the pelvic viscera, you're seeing the peritoneum reflex on top of the viscera. And the exception is going to be the fallopian tubes are encased in peritoneum, and then the ovaries, actually the peritoneum breaks down and just has a simple cuboidal epithelium covering. And we're going to talk about this special circumstance on Friday. Okay, so there is an exception, so don't uh, send me 30 emails today that I, I made the incorrect statement. I'm going to get to this, but just generally, the uh, organs in the viscera are inferior to the peritoneum. Okay, so these reflections are going to actually make spaces, potential spaces where things can collect, infection and pus and blood, and, and these uh, spaces we call pouches. So in the uterine pelvis, where there is a uterus, there are going to be two spaces, a recto-uterine pouch that's between the rectum and the uterus, and a vesico-uterine pouch that is between the bladder and the uterus. Okay. And you can find those spaces before you take off the peritoneum. You can go, oh, oh, look here, the space is right here, and, and understand that when you're looking at medical imaging and you're looking at things collecting in these spaces, in these pouches, that this is the region that you're in, the region. And then the non-uterine pelvis is going to have one pouch called the rectovesical pouch, which is going to be between the bladder and the rectum. Okay. All right, pelvic fascia. Now, we're taking the peritoneum off. Let's pretend like the peritoneum isn't there. We're still going to have fascia that's in the pelvis. I mean, all muscles have fascia on, on both sides. You looked at the abdominal wall. You found fascia, the inside and outside of all of the muscles as you went through and had to, you know, think about them and see them and peel them back. Well, we have fascia in the pelvis, too. And we have different types of felt fascia, and they call them very specific names so that you can, um, when you're talking to other clinicians or you're, you're writing, you're suturing or, you know, you're doing, uh, looking at medical imaging and you're diagnosing, you can talk about these fascias and people, other people know where you're referring to. Okay. Now, this is a, uh, illustration of a mid-sagittal, well, not parasagittal view. So we're looking, um, laterally on this pelvis. So you can see here's the rectum, here's the uterus, here's the vagina, the bladder, piercing, here's the pelvic diaphragm here, okay, here's the pubic symphysis. And the peritoneum is the most innermost gray line that's just reflecting on the viscera and coming back up. But then you can see that there are blue lines on this drawing, and these are the fascias that are part of the pelvic, pelvic fascia. There are, is fascia that is covering the organs on the outside of the organs, making up like it's serosa. Generally speaking, it can be membranous, having fibers, collagen and elastic. It can have some uh, loose areolar connected tissue on it too. You're going to see all different types of, of uh, condensations of connective tissue. This is called visceral fascia, the visceral fascia. 
which is generally more membranous. Now, the parietal fascia, which is this blue layer here, is actually only lining the walls of the pelvis. And what's on the walls of the pelvis? Muscles. So it's the innermost fascia of the muscles that are lining the walls of the pelvis that we just talked about. That's called parietal fascia, parietal pelvic fascia. Parietal on the body wall, viscera on the viscera, okay? Then you have fascia in between the wall and the viscera. That's called endopelvic fascia. It's in between the parietal and viscera. That's all it is. Always go back to that home base, that rule. Endopelvic fascia is between parietal and viscera. So when you're looking down on the pelvis, like in this view, you have fascia that's on the walls. Let's pretend like I can see the walls. Okay? You have fascia that's over the organs, on the organs, on the viscera, visceral fascia. And then you have in between fascia that's called endopelvic fascia. Got it? Good. Those are your home bases. Now, this is a, another kind of uh, illustration, sort of line drawing. This is a coronal section, and this is a generic section. It's not pointing out any particular organ. It just says viscera. And I'm just going to say this point one more time just to make sure that you understand. We have parietal fascia on the wall. We have visceral fascia over ex viscera. It could be any viscera here. And then we have endopelvic fascia in between. And the reason why the endopelvic fascia is important, one of the reasons why, is because we oftentimes have neurovasculature coursing underneath certain parts of this endopelvic fascia. We have neurovasculature that's going to the pelvis that's underneath the fascia. Okay? All right. Okay. Now, yes? Do we have any fascia between, say, the, the uterus and the bladder? Uh, the question is, uh, do we have any fascia between the uterus and the bladder? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. So, I will get to that. We have special parts of this endopelvic fascia that have uh, thickenings. They're just more collagenous and elastic fibers and less loose tissue. And the textbook and your dissector refers to these thickenings as, I'm sorry, but ligaments. Okay? So when you're hearing about pelvic ligaments, they are thicker condensations of endopelvic fascia that help support viscera. And there are some clinically relevant ones here that I added in here. Now, the terminology isn't always consistent between the dissector and the textbook, and I went back and forth a million times until last night it was like 11, and I was still really trying to brace myself for what... What I was going to say. So I, I came, uh, I came down with using some of the textbook and, um, and narrowing this down. The textbook talks about one of these ligaments being this hypogastric sheath. The, the sector doesn't talk about this, but I, I do understand why they bring it up. The hypogastric sheath is the endopelvic fascia if you go from the rectum to the lateral walls of the pelvis. And the way that they describe it in the textbook, if you put your hand in the anterior, like on the side of the bladder, and you put your other hands on the side of the rectum, and you try to put your hands together, there's going to be a band of connective tissue that is going to stop your hands from touching, and that's called the hypogastric sheath, collectively, which is an endopath pelvic fascia or a uh, pelvic ligament, okay? We're all talking about the same thing. That's just one of them. And then you have, um, and then there's also a pubovesical ligament that's between the pubis and the bladder. These two are going to be in the uterine or non-uterine pelvis. Okay. But then you have three important clinical ligaments, which are thickenings of endopelvic fascia, that are only in the uterine pelvis that are important for stabilizing the uterus. Well, they, they would, could be in the non-uterine pelvis if you had just removed the uterus. But they're important for stabilizing the uterus during pregnancy and childbirth. And so those are depicted here. Um, and then I have them shown and highlighted in here uh, in the color to match the, the names. So you can see that you have a pubocervical, you have the cardinal ligaments, and then you have uter uterosacral. There are other ligaments that your textbook talks about. The textbook gives you like 12. 
And uh, it's just that your dissector gives you even less. And so I kind of came to the middle ground here. What, what did you really need to know? I actually had to call an anatomist in and do a consult, and I'm waiting for the bill. But uh, so, uh, so here we go. All right. Now, there are lots of neurovascular structures of the pelvis. I'm not going to talk to you about them today. You're going to receive this information in subsequent lectures that I'm going to give you and Dr. Campo is going to give you. This will all be explained to you. It will come together. The dissector goes a little bit more forward as they go. We're going to talk about branches of these uh, neurovascular uh, structures and divisions of the ner nervous system. But in the end, we were going to get you there. So trust us, okay? Please. All right. Oh. Okay, I need you to identify the highlighted structure. But this is a false quiz slide. Um, this, I'm going to let you look at the structure up close, and then the next one's the real turning point slide, okay? So here we go. I'm going to magnify the view. Think about what do you think that structure is. I'm going to give you a minute here, and then I'm going to advance. All right, make a guess here. What do you think that structure is? This is the real turning point slide. Come on, Paul. Okay, the poll is open. Make your choice. What do you think this structure is? You should be uh, been staring at this for a while. Yes. Oh, no question. Okay. All right. Make your choice. Five, four, three, two, one. Most people got the correct answer. The medial umbilical fold. All right. Yeah. Not too bad. You can see the median here. You can see inferior epigastric, so the medial umbilical fold. Okay, what structure is within this medial umbilical fold during fetal life? Come on. All right, I'm not going to wait. What structure is it? Umbilical artery, all right. Just advance. Okay. All right. Now, I need to talk to you about this because you're going to lab. And perineum isn't until Wednesday. I'm not teaching perineum till Wednesday, but yet you're going into the perineal region today. And so I need to give you some information, okay? That was the end of the introduction. I need you to understand the difference between the pelvic cavity and the pelvis and the perineum. Where is the perineum at? The perineum is going to be this area that's between the thighs and the buttocks, okay, that is going to house external genitalia and the anus and anal canal. Right? Now, it is going to be inferior to the pelvic diaphragm. So the Perineum goes superior up to the pelvic diaphragm. That's your home base. When you're looking at the perineum in anatomic position, it really doesn't, you know, uh, give you an indication of really its anatomic description or area or boundaries. But when you look at the perineal area with the thighs abducted, you can see that the perineum is going to be the area that is between the thighs, buttocks, it's going to include the anus, it's going to include external genitalia, it's all, all in this area here, okay? And um, it's really helpful also when you're looking at that pelvic outlet to understand that those are going to be the boundaries of the perineum. So the perineum is going to extend superiorly all the way up to the diaph pelvic diaphragm. Well, your pelvic diaphragm isn't sitting right underneath your skin, is it? No. 
So there's a lot of space there, and you're going to be in that space today, in one, one particular uh, part of that space. Okay. And so you have boundaries. You have uh, the pubic symphysis that is going to be anterior part of this perineum, because here's where all the external genitalia is going to be located. You have the ischial pubic rami, the ischial tuberosities. You have the sacred tuberous ligament, because it's going to the ischial tuberosity. I drew that in here. And then you also have the inferior part of the sacrum and the coccyx. And so again, when you can uh, uh, give yourself a little quiz later and check and make sure that you um, know where those structures are located from an inferior view. Okay, now if you join the ischial tuberosities together with this imaginary line, you are dividing the perineum into two triangles. Okay? One of the triangles, the anterior one, is called the urogenital triangle. It's going to have the inferior part of the urinary system, or the urethra, come through, and you're also going to have the external genitalia in that area. Okay. And that urogenital triangle is special because it is um, it contains a membrane, a very thick um, Collagen, it has collagen and elastic fibers membrane that courses between the ischial pubic rami. I mean, you have a hiatus for the urethra and vagina to come through, but you have a membrane, and that's called the perineal membrane. Now, the other triangle, the one that's more posterior, is called the ischial anal triangle. And this triangle does not have a thick membrane that courses between, doesn't have, uh, really, it's the posterior aspect of the issue in these tuberosities, so it doesn't have any, any bones on this side for this membrane attached to anyways. So that triangle is deeper. You can go deeper in that triangle all the way up to the pelvic diaphragm, and all of that is the perineum. And you're, you're going to be coursing through that today, the ischial tri uh, anal triangle. Okay. Now, so here we see this anal triangle. It is going to be a pyramid shape, so it's going to be more deep uh, superiorly, and it's going to be wider. The base is at the superficial portion, so when you're attacking it, the widest part is where you see it front, and then it's going to narrow into a pyramid towards the top. Okay, It's going to have lots of fat inside. Sorry, it's just this is uh, one of those things. Lots of fat inside that you're going to be wading through. The anal canal is contained in this triangle. And there are some important neurovascular structures that you'll be finding today. Here is another view of the ischial anal fossa, this part of the perineum. And this is the pyramid shape where it has a wider base at the skin, more superficial, and it narrows at the top. Okay? And when you look at the boundaries of this ischial anal fossa, what you see is that the pelvic diaphragm, the levator ani here, is going to blend with the anal sphincters, and that's going to make the medial border. The skin, subcutaneous tissue, is going to be the inferior border, and then the uh, ischial tuberosity and ischial um, and the obturator internus muscle is going to be the lateral border. Okay, and so that's kind of a little confusing um, how, do, how am I looking at the obturator internus from looking inferiorly? But I have uh, something to help you out there. Now, on the obturator internus muscle, you have neurovascular structures that are encased in fascia that are coursing inferiorly to try to get to their destinations. One is being towards the rectum, I mean towards the anal canal, and the other is is actually going towards the perineum itself, okay? So that, that fascia is called the pudendal canal and actually covers over the neurovascular structures. You'll have to cut it open to see the neurovascular structures. But when you tug on them, you can feel the indentation in where the, where the neurovascular structures are contained, okay? Now, some of the structures are going to traverse this canal. Some of these neurovascular structures are not going to stay on the wall. They're going to come towards the anal canal. Uh, the inferior rectal nerves and arteries are going to be the, of the structures, the most important ones that traverse the canal that you're going to feel. So you don't just want to go in and cut all that fat out, or you're going to cut off your inferior rectals. All right? And you want to keep those so that you know where they are, and you're going to use them to bring yourself back to the pudendal canal where you can open up the pudendal canal and see the pudendal nerve and the internal pudendal vessels. All right, 
And so this is, uh, these are some little more detailed views here where it's not just bones and, and muscles. And you can see this is from an inferior view. Um, you can see these neurovascular structures coursing through this anal triangle. Um, um, sorry, I'm way too anterior. This is not the anal triangle. Um, this is the anal triangle. This is still all the perineum. So you can see the neurovascular structures come through the anal triangle. The inferior rectals here have been cut off in this diagram. And you can see the other neurovascular structures depicted. Uh, in this view, you can see the fascia on the obturator internus muscle. This is the pudendal canal, and here's inferior rectal artery. There is nerves, there are nerves too, but this is just the inferior rectal artery coursing towards the anal, anal canal from the wall of the obturator internus and the pudendal canal. And you're going to open this up and look at these neurovascular structures. This is the posterior view. You're looking anteriorly. Here are the ischial tuberosity staring you in the face. And up here, I have a movie where I uh, put the obturator internus muscle uh, on a bone and I showed you the course of the pudendal nerve as it wraps around and so you understand how when you're looking inferiorly at the uh, coxal bones, why you're looking at the obturator internus muscle. Okay. That's all from me. Good luck in lab. The rest will be continued on Wednesday and Friday. Okay.